Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Chanel Thavaraja. I am the Internship Programs Manager with Environment for the Americas. Um, so I help with the Golden Gate National Recreation Area Program, the Mosaics and Science Program, and the Fish and Feathers Program. Um, and yeah, I will pass it over to Shelda to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. My name is Shelda Diaz, and I am the Mosaics and Science Program Manager. I'm going to pass it to our speaker, Catherine Troutman. All right, then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. So glad you could come to the class. I am Catherine Troutman, and I wrote a book for students, I don't know, 10 years ago, I guess. There it is. You have a copy of it, I think. I'm pretty sure you do. Students Federal Queer Guide. And um, I wrote it because students need to have help. If you want to get a federal job, the resume that you might write for private sector right out of college is going to be too short and doesn't include all the content that the human resources people need. My big came, claim to fame and how I came to be an expert is this one right here. I wrote the first ever book on federal resume writing in the whole world. Yeah, the whole world. <laughs> and this is not just for students, it's for everybody. But what I do in my work is I own a company called The Resume Place, and we work one, one at a time with people on their resumes. They send us their resume, the announcement, and we look at the resume and see what's missing and try to figure out how the resume could help you to get best qualified, how to help you get referred, how to get an interview and get hired. So that's what I do one at, one at a time. And then we teach classes. I teach classes with... National Park Service and FEMA, Homeland Security, NOAA, mm -hmm. everybody, PO missiles, all kinds of agents. Uh, everybody needs help with their federal resume because it's so different than the private sector resume. Now for this class, I am going to use the chat box here and there, so please find it. And I'm gonna be asking you some questions and they're gonna be easy questions. You don't have to type too much, but, um, the first question I want to ask you is this one. Do you have a USA Jobs account set up now? Because you have to do that before you apply for a federal job. Do you have an account now set up? Go ahead and just write in there if you do or not. I hope you do. If you don't, after we get done with the class, you're going to do it. <laughs> so there. It looks like we're about 50-50. Yeah, so that's, that's the first part of applying for a federal job is getting your account set up. And then, you know, of course, the resume, you got to do that all at the same time. Okay, here's another question for you about your current resume that you have right now. Right now, how many pages is your resume right now? <laughs> Glenn wrote a note in there. I'll tell you about that in a second. How many pages? Oh, one. Ooh, how do you do that? Well, it's too short. <laughs> By the time you're done listening to me talk about your resume and content, you're going to write at least three pages. Yeah, three. We're going to go for three. We're not going to go for more than that, but three. Now, uh, you'll see a note here that uh, Glenn, Glenn says he has an eight-page resume. Um, Glenn Hooks is here in the class, and he is a uh, National Park Service recruiter, human resources person. And he just put a note in here. I don't know where it is. But he said, make your resume searchable. Hey, Glenn, can you talk? <laughs> yes, I can talk. Hey, Glenn, Glenn, tell everybody why they should make their resume searchable in USA Jobs. Please tell us. All right. As the lead recruiter for National Park Service, I have a team of four other recruiters, and we spend one third of our time data mining resumes in USA Jobs. If they're not searchable, we cannot see them. So we use the search engines the same way that you use them in USA Jobs to find job announcements. We use that same methodology to find your resume so we can refer you to a job announcement to apply for it. And we do the pre-clearing to say, hey, we think your resume is qualified and you have a good opportunity to be referred. Otherwise, you'll never hear from us. So Glenn, I'm just dying to know, G give us a couple of ideas of what you search for just, you know, how do you, is it by degree, by major, by employment, by what? 
Well, obviously, we got to go off the job announcement. So the first thing we look for is an easy sort because we're sorting through tens of thousands of resumes. So if there's a positive education requirement, that's the first thing. So if you do not have a bachelor's associate or security plus or whatever that positive education requirement is, that's our very first search method. The second method is we look at the qualifications and requirements from the job announcement. If we can't quantify those, that's the second we kick the resume out. And the most important one I, that I see the largest mistakes on is we look for that one year worth of experience at the lower level than what that job is. So if we cannot, cannot articulate that you have one year, 52 weeks of experience at the lower level, either through a salary, hourly wage, or some type of methodology other than salary, then we won't refer you to what we call a talent pool. And then that talent pool goes forward. That is not a referral in the system. This is all before you even apply for the position. Okay. That is really excellent. Thank you for saying all that. Okay, I got a question for you though, Glenn. What if this um, student or young person has uh, three internships? and they worked in the internships about a year each, and they work 20 hours a week. Would you add that up and say that it's one year specialized experience? Yes, absolutely. Uh, just like the public land court is 640 hours, those qualify you for a special hiring authority. So when in USA Jobs, you look at the hiring pass, uh, like the internships and apprenticeships you're on right now, once you get those certificates, those certificates are locked. It's important that you upload those in your US job, USA Jobs application so we can see that. Because that tells us that we can use a direct hire or a special hiring authority for you. And please ensure that you educate yourself on the hiring paths in USA Jobs so you select what hiring path you are part of, i.e. recent graduate, student, internship pathways, so on and so forth, because that's one of the search criteria that us recruiters look for to try to pre-cert you for a job and invite you to apply for that specific job so you have a better chance of being referred. Yeah, you know, that one-year specialized experience, most people don't know how critically important it is that um, you have hours per week on each one of your jobs, your internships, and your part-time jobs and, and especially the one you have now, because a lot of people, when you write a one page or two page resume, you don't even think to um, put hours per week. But Glenn just said his recruiters, four recruiters in him are looking for one, they're looking for the education first. Oh, another thing, Glenn. So the education, a lot of times in the announcements, uh, they say they want certain courses and certain number of courses. Is that, that's really important too, right? It is. But the trend is we're starting to see some of those require, you know, 24 business hours of college uh -huh. uh, business uh, or of uh, natural science and stuff like that. We're starting to see the trend is starting to see that go away. And we're actually seeing, you know, degrees are actually becoming recommendations versus positive education requirements. But right now there still are a lot of them, mm -hmm. especially for national parts service and national sciences. Those are, are, are still positive education requirements. But yeah, we, we look through the entire resume. So if you got 50 weeks here, you got 16 weeks there, that will get you that one year of qualified experience. Look at some of the comments in the chat. Yeah, you know, um, that probably is the biggest problem that uh, students might have is making sure the resume has month and year to month and year and hours per week for each internship or, um, uh, what about a really important capstone? Students have a lot of really big capstones in their last year. If they were to write up the capstone like a project or a job and say they worked on it 10 hours a week for you know 40 weeks, would that count as specialized experience also if the capstone shows the specialized experience? Absolutely. If, if you build that capstone as, let's say, like a position, when you look at the USA yeah. Jobs resume format, if you write it as a position in 11 weeks, if it's a quarter or how long the semester is, or any volunteer work, if you list it as a specific description and you write in what your qualifications and how that relates to the requirements and qualifications on the job announcement, you're going to get credit for that, whatever that time frame that you have there. And that will that is accumulative towards that requirement. 
Yeah, that's really that's really good, Glenn, because um, a lot of people don't know that volunteer experience is equal to paid experience in the government, and they don't know the capstone can be used or, or the thesis. Like if you've got a thesis or a dissertation for a master's or PhD level, most PhD people that I coach don't even have the title of their dissertation in their resume. I, so you know that that's a job block. The dissertation is a job block every day of the week because you work on it for a year or two. And you do, um, you know, a whole lot of specific work, uh, and you have a title, and so everybody masters. If you have a thesis or if you have a dissertation, that has to be a job block, not just a write up. Because, like Glenn said, you want to show that one year specialized experience. You might have five years specialized experience. Um, are there people who you, if you want to send me your resume during the class, I'll review it, and you can let me know if you want me to show it to the class, if you're brave enough. I, I'm really nice. I'm really nice. I, here's my email. Send it to my personal email. I get it faster. Catherine at gmail.com. Um, if you want to send it, go ahead. So I'm going to be go ahead and begin the uh, PowerPoint. Glenn, thank you so much for chiming in. It was so excellent. I just he see he's HR National Park Service. Okay, so he's a real thing. Okay, everybody. I, I am too, but you know I'm not HR. I'm not HR. Hold on, don't you get the PowerPoint up here? So this PowerPoint goes along with the book that you've got. And we're just gonna use, we're gonna use the PowerPoint today. We're also gonna use the book. And then also I'm gonna be seeing you again in DC. So um, you will, you'll see me again a little bit uh, in August, it'll be a while from now. Okay, so I don't think you can see the PowerPoint yet. Wait a minute, let me get it up here. Where'd he go? It's over here. We're using Zoom right now. Are we using Zoom or Teams, you, you guys? Oh, it's Teams. No, it's not. Zoom, sorry. <laughs> there it is, I got it now. We got it. Here we are. All right, everybody, sorry. I'll see this. Share. I had it up before. All right. Up to put PowerPoint up down. Okay, you can see it's the screen now, I think, right? Okay, we got it. Okay, so there are 10 steps to what's in the book and in the PowerPoint here. The first step, we're going to talk about accomplishments and how important they are to add to your resume. And I hope you have your resume with you for the class because I would like you to be looking at your resume while we teach the class so that you can um, you know, make some notes or um, because after we finish the class, you're gonna have to work on your resume and change it. So I want you to be able to remember everything. After that, we're gonna talk about pathways. We're gonna search for some jobs. I'm gonna talk about keywords, a basic resume format, the best format, applying on USA Jobs interview. And <laughs> let me tell you right now, Sometimes you can negotiate your job offer if you have highly specialized experience. So we'll talk about it. And then you can become a permanent federal employee off of a pathways announcement. So this is what we're covering here. And then I'm gonna cover more information when we talk in August in person at Department of Interior. So accomplishments. So here we go. Um, see the sparkle statement in here? I heard this statement from a recruiter at Ellis Island <laughs> before the pandemic. And he was the superintendent for the interpreters. And he was in my class. And he, he, he stood up and he said, I am the person who receives all resumes for summer internships myself. I said, he said, I get 600. I said, what the hell in the world do you deal with that? He said, well, I get they're screened out. So I know that there's specialized experience and they have the degree. I know that. But when I look at the resume, I just look for the sparkle. 
Don't you love that? He looks for the sparkle. He's looking for something different. He's looking for something that's interesting in the resume. So it could be uh, your courses. It could be an internship project. It could be travel, interest speaking, something that's outstanding in your background. And so this is a format that we talk about for accomplishments. We want this, the context of where you did this, the challenge of what was happening, the action, what did you do? and the results, what happened. So you could use that for your capstone. You could use it for your National Park Service project that you're working on now in your internship. Uh, it could be an internship, another internship. Here's a sample of a independent research project for a person who has a BS in biology. Uh, she was seeking an FDA position. So the context was she conducted independent research to develop processes. The challenge was, the project was significant investment of time as we had to build and deconstruct the project. Actions were, I managed the research team from beginning to end. We collected water, soil samples. Results were successfully presented research findings at this symposium. That's called a CCAR. That's an accomplishment. And if you put it in the resume, that's what it would look like right there. It's short, it's not as long as what I just showed you. You probably don't have any independent research projects described in your resume now, but this could help your resume. It could show specialized experience. Now, if you wanna show specialized experience for Glenn, you would have to add month and year and hours per week. Um, month and year two, month and year and hours per week to get credit. So if this person worked on this from uh, September of 2021 to January of 2022, and she worked on this for 10 hours a week, uh, that would be equal to about a half a year, no, about a quarter of a year. But that's, what, that's how you would get credit for it. So I would like you to look at your resume now and tell me if you have any project written up under education, we're talking about education now. Do you have a, a research project, a capstone um, thesis, any, any project described from college? Just say yes, no, not sure, something. Oh, you do, good. Well, you know, you could have several. You don't have to have just one. That's how the resume becomes three pages, is by adding the projects to your education and adding the projects to your experience as well. Um, I taught a class at Virginia Tech in Richmond a lot of years ago, five years ago. Every engineering student in the whole school was there, about 135, all levels, bachelor's, master's, everybody. And I was in person. And I said to them as a group, I said, what do you do with your capstone on your resume? Do you, do you write it out? Do you describe it? Have dates or anything? They said, no, we don't. That's too bad because engineers have huge capstone projects that last a whole year and maybe 20 hours a week. Very, very big deal not to add to the resume. And that's private sector as well. You know, you would need to add that for private sector as well. So either way. Okay, so now it's better hiring. So our private sector resumes are one to two, federal two to four. I saw most of you have the short versions, one, two pages. Uh, we had a question here from Maria. Um, Glenn, you can answer this. She says, what do you mean by searchable? A searchable document is in the settings of USA Jobs. And the answer is yeah. So Glenn, how do you search? How do you do that? That is correct. Uh, <clears throat> for the candidate, when you build your resume, it'll have a checkbox asking if you can make that searchable or not. So you'll go into those settings uh, while you're building it or uploading your resume and make sure it's searchable. That's all you and have to you do. Go in search, just like you search for a job, I search for a candidate. Right. So and since he's, he's an HR person, he's, he's got a screen that allows him to search by degree or the hiring authority. So he can break it down pretty easily. Thanks, Glenn. Here's another question here, Ash. I worked only worked 50 
weeks, 40 hours a week. Would that qualify or disqualify me? For <laughs> yeah, it would. Can you please find two more weeks somewhere? <laughs> look at your coursework. Look at your capstone. Look at volunteer work. You can find yeah. those two weeks somewhere. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Find two weeks somewhere. You can find 50 weeks, 20 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question. That's great. Okay. So that's the length difference. And it's really a big deal because they want to see more. A cover letter, um, you don't have to use it for, for federal. Private sector, they do like it. Okay, Glenn, let me ask you, since you're on the class, do you read cover letters if a student sends a cover letter in? I do not. Now, I'm a recruiter. I'm yeah. before it goes to the hiring manager and HR staffing professionals. Yeah. Most HR staffing professionals that I know do not read the cover letters as well. However, hiring managers usually will read it. So you got to focus on getting referred first mm -hmm. and get in that interview, being selected for the interview before realistically a hiring manager will actually read the cover letter. Some yeah. do, some don't. Yeah, that is... Uh... That's the right answer. Recruiters wouldn't read it, but the hiring manager might. But really and truly, I want you to spend your time on your resume and do every single thing I'm telling you to do. And if you run out of time, don't do the letter. That's all. If you want to do it, you can, that's fine. Um, Isabel asked, what is the length requirement for experience hours? Well, I'll show you announcements soon, but most of the time they say they want you to have one year specialized experience, and that would be 52 weeks, 40 hours, or two years at 20 hours, something like that. I think that's what you're asking. Tran so transcripts here have, are required. If there's a positive education requirement, like Glenn said, transcripts have to be in there for sure. Private sector, maybe, I don't know. The jobs are on USA Jobs, but they might also come from somebody like Glenn, who's a recruiter. He might find your resume and you have uh, the education he wants and experience he wants. He'll send you an email. So USA Jobs is number one. Yeah. But, you know, you might get an email. Maria says, what is replacing 25 credit hours of science type of requirements? Oh, that's just... um. When you have the education section in the announcement, it might say that you have, have to have a bachelor's degree in biology or something. And then in the next paragraph, it might say you need to have 25 hours in these courses and they'll name them one, two, three, four, five, six. That's what that is. It's not, it's not working hours, it's classroom hours. Not all the announcements say that. And Glenn says it's gonna go away though, maybe someday. Uh, how to apply, apply online at USA Jobs or follow directions. And then look, this is what it just, what Glenn just said, qualifications. Read the specialized experience section of the announcement and you have to show that you meet the minimum qualifications. That's real important. I'll show you where to find it. I'll go live to some announcements. So the public land authority is where you work 640 hours, you have the certificate and then you comply as a student. And um, it says here 120 days after the completion of the PLC project. Is that true, uh, Glenn? Is it 120 days past the project? That's only four months. Yes, that, that is correct. All right. Well, you better get on it. Yeah. Now, there are some exceptions to that policy. So just because it's more than 120 days, don't try to use, uh, keep using that certificate. Once you get that certificate at the end of 640, keep using it. There's yeah. a lot of discussion about extending that uh, or even doing away with it. But right now, the 120 hours uh, is still correct. Oh, Diana wrote in here, she was told two years. That would be good. <laughs> Ash says two years. Well, we'll look it up for everybody, right? We'll get back to you on that one. Because like Glenn said, uh, they want to change that. It got changed to two years in 2019, didn't it? Well, if it did, yeah. we'll look it up. Now that's talking about the how long that cert is 
verifiable. I mean, that's how long that cert, when you get that certification, when you complete the 640, mm -hmm. it's good for two years. And of course, we're trying to get that extent too. 120 hours, talking about serving on a project utilizing the, hundred, the uh, pub, public lands legal authority. So that means you, you are on a PLC assignment or an internship or a project okay. because you can get those other 640 hours outside of a PLC event. That's what we're not talking about how long the cert is qualified for that you can use that hiring authority. Okay. This it has to be at least 120 hours of the, of the 640. And you serve right in the program, right? Correct. Right. Okay. All right, good. So um pathways. So this is pathways positions. You can get a pathways announcement job during high school college undergraduate within two years after college, uh, during graduate school and two years after graduate school, that's the Pathways internship. Pathways recent grad is within two years after you graduate. If you don't apply for a federal job as a new graduate uh, master's level, within two years, you can't use Pathways. Some people go back to school so they can use it. And you can use it during graduate school also. And the PMF is once a year, master's level only, comes out August, it's very, uh, very influential. So um, you have to just look up, look for that and maybe apply for it, master's level. So eligibility for internships, you have to be a full-time student and you have to show that you're a full-time student to be eligible for that. Recent grad, two years within graduating, Veterans can go um, apply for a graduate, recent graduate within six years. They give them a little bit more time. Now, this is interesting. Here's the grade level. So a GS5 right there is uh, four years above high school, which is bachelor's degree. That's a GS5. But if you are bachelor's level and you have a GPA of uh, 2.95 or higher, you can qualify for a GS7. That's called superior academic achievement. So if your GPA is 2.95 or 3.0 or higher, be sure to put it on your resume. Very important. It's equal to 13,000 a year for you by typing your GPA on your resume. That's a really big distinction between the five and the seven. And then master's degree is GS9. And the PhD is 11, and that's it for education, uh, education being required. So GS5 is bachelor's degree, GPA is less than 2.95. Now the jobs have to be open for the 5.7. So if you see a job that's open for GS5 slash seven, and your GPA is 3.5 or something, you can apply for the seven because you'll qualify for it because of your GPA. Hey, Glenn, do you think they should apply for the five and the seven, or should they just skip the five and apply for the seven? If it's five and seven or the GPA is three, five or something, what do you think? Apply for both of them. I mean, there's no, the general rule of thumb is apply, 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 because you don't know. I mean, if you get referred to one, you don't get the other one. Then because of your GPA, you may be able to negotiate uh, into a higher step. In rare cases, but in some cases you might. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tatiana says, I qualified for the seven, but HR said she couldn't. Um, wait a minute. So I, she accepted the five. Okay. Yeah, the slides will be there. Okay, here we go. So there it is. Uh, for the GS7, you need the GPA, 3.0 or higher, or 2.95, they say. Also in the uh, membership National Honor Society could qualify you for the seven also. And then veterans preference, if you are a veteran, um, veterans preference does apply to pathways positions, most of them, unless it's direct hire. But so veterans preference is very, very strong for pathways positions and you can, uh, there is a preference for veterans. So if you're a veteran, Upload the documents and for veterans preference as well as your transcripts and um, other documents. Okay, now searching for jobs, you can just go to pathways, 
and the jobs will come right up. I think I will um, go over to USA Jobs now. I, can you see my screen? Let me see. Are you sure? There we go. Uh, let's do National Park Service. All jobs. You can see my screen, right? Somebody shake their head. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, we'll do uh, we'll do students. There's only five jobs for students. Let's do land and base management. Let's do GS7. All right. 12. Only 12 jobs. Jeez. All right. Well, that's how I searched. I searched for land and base management. There's only 12. And then I went to the uh, GS7. And let's just look at this here. So this is... um. Oh, let's do this one. This is science or oriented one here in uh, Utah. Okay, so while we're here on the screen, oh, uh, they're going to close it after 100 applications. So whenever you see that, you should apply as quickly as you can. This is a queer seasonal appointment. Okay. Land and base management is not open to the public. Now I want to show you the one-year specialized experience that we're talking about. So this is a GS 79. So if you were to get the job as a seven, the next year you could be a nine. Now the duties here are not the specialized experience we've been talking about. This is what you would do if you're hired. But the specialized experience, let's see what the education is. All right, this is unusual here. Okay, uh, you have to have one year specialized experience equal to a sixth level. And the sixth level is, I'll talk about this in a second. So you have to show that you've done measured data collection activities for samples. You have to show that you've identified and measured uh, counting organisms for the environment and that you've recorded and entered and checked data. And then look, it says, or, and you have to include hours per week. See, we talked about that. Or you have to have one year graduate education, or you can have both. So this is a job that is not positive education requirement for a degree, because see the or there? Or, or, it doesn't say and, it says or. Okay, now here's the eight level. If you want to qualify for the, um, Eight, you have to show one year specialized at the seven, training other people in measured data. So I'm going to type these words. Oh, I got 11 messages. Oh my gosh, you guys. Hold on. I'm trying to help you out and answer some of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Glenn says the DD214 and VS Service Connected letter. Yes, do that. All right, Glenn, you can answer this one. Do I qualify for a 10? She has a master's and nine months of unrelated experience as a nine. Rarely I, is there ever such a thing as a GS10 position anymore. It's usually either a nine or 11. <clears throat> Theoretically, yes. It all comes down to exactly what Catherine, yeah, Catherine has shown you with the experience and or education. You have to meet that qualification and we have to find that in your resume somewhere. Yeah. Maria says, I've heard, yeah, she has 10 minutes. Oh, awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, GS 10 is not, is not probably going to occur in uh, the science field. Is it possible to qualify for a GS 8 with a bachelor's? Uh, no, 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 it's a GS 5 or 7 if your GPA is 3, 5 or more. The GS 8. Probably, you know, the only time a GS8 appears is if it's a technician kind of job. And I don't think you could qualify with uh, for a GS8 with a bachelor's. I think you would be a six. So I don't think you're going to see it too often. Uh, Shelda says, could you qualify, but, but others would easily have more advantage over you with the master's. Yeah, it's true. Master's. 
uh, is very competitive. One year experience in any industry? Well, Kylie, so look at this. Look at the questions here. So perform measured data collection activities for physical and biological samples. So it's not really industry oriented, it's type of work oriented. So if you have measured data collection in manufacturing for physical and biological samples, yep, that works. Or if you've done it, uh, National Park Service in the field, you just got to say you've measured data collection activities. Or college you... labs. We've seen people use their college labs to, to show that. Yeah, that's right. Labs experience, right. Does federal work study count for something? Yes, it does, Kaylee. But you have to have uh, the title of your work study, where you're working, a description of your work, month and year to month and year, and hours per week to get the credit. That is a really big point we're making here today. Tatiana says, do I have to have my degree to start applying? No, you don't. You can apply right now. It does take months to get hired. It is a timing thing. Good luck, everybody. It is timing, I know. But you can start ahead. Um, here's, uh, let's see, let's do this one. There's a lot of fee people here. Oh, Park Ranger, Utah. Oh, let's do this one, BLM. It's a 5-7. There are two vacancies. And it's open to uh, land-based people. Now, I'm going to show you the one-year specialized that Glenn and I have been talking about the whole time. Here we go. Your resume has to, your resume doesn't have to match all this. Just, just go past it. Right here, you gotta have a license, okay? That's a selected placement factor. That's mandatory license, which you probably have. There it is right there. Look, there's Oregon. Wow. Oh. Catherine, you'll be surprised how many resumes do not state that they have a valid driver's license. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you yeah. will be surprised. <laughs> I no, know. You probably will. You probably will. <laughs> so, so everybody, everybody in the class, be sure to type on your resume, maybe do name, address, phone, email. Hiring authority would be public lands or internship. And then type valid driver's license in your state. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Glenn? Yeah, I'd recommend putting it with your, your summary of education, certifications, yeah, credentials, right. and something like that. Yeah. 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 Well, and those requirements up above, make sure you cover all those. Don't worry about the duties, like Catherine said. But those yeah. requirements, if if you're if you're male and you've signed up for selective service, make sure you put that in there as well. That's a that's a rule. Okay, so here's the specialized experience right here. Okay, I'm going to copy and paste this into the chat box right there. Okay, now the words that Glenn and the HR people are going to look for are. I'm going to type it in the chat box. Look. Um, explain regulations to park visitors, uh, information and advice on park activities, collect fees, issue reservations and permits, uh, maintain uh, facilities or trails, monitor special recreation permits. So in your internship that you've had here for the last whatever months, if you've done any of these, see those words right there I just typed? That's what you need to show. You have one full year of specialized experience equal to the four level, which is you know one level under the five. That would be internship. So Glenn is really, really serious about you showing in your resume that you have one year specialized experience at this work. So you could get this experience from your internship, um, from uh, volunteer work. You might've done other work in the park service, volunteer, you probably have. And, or look at this here, we have an or, or successful completion of a four year course. And look, it says right there, 24 semester hours. Okay, now everybody listen to me. I know the transcript is mandatory that you upload it. Now you might be thinking, 
that they need to read the transcript if they want to see my 24 credit hours. Well, don't take a chance. Go ahead and type in the resume, your 24 semester hours and related coursework, and type your course titles. And you could put three next to it if you want, and four, or whatever. But just make it easy for HR and for recruiters to see that you do have these courses. And under your education, your master's degree, and whatever it is, or bachelor's uh, major courses, and type them. And you can say 24 hours in related coursework, colon, one, two, three. Don't you think that's a good idea, Glenn, to have the, res the courses in the resume if they're trying to qualify on education? It makes our lives a lot easier. And I will tell you, honestly, there's times where we make assumptions based on how many times we've seen transcripts based on a degree. Yeah. So if you're in a, a MBA and it requires 24 business hours, I'm going to assume that you have those 24 business hours. Other recruiters will not. HR specialists may or may not go to that transcript, but I would not, would not take a chance with relying on getting your transcript read. I have, I have seen people get uh, not get hired because of the education that's required for jobs. It's not written out. And the HR people say, we didn't see it. And they didn't get hired and they made a mistake. So just type it in the resume so it's really clear. So this one year specialized experience appears everywhere. It's on all the announcements and you have to pay very close attention to it. Now, while I'm on the announcement, I'm gonna go down to another section. Oh, look at this, everybody. You know what this means here? I'll tell you. It means that there's gonna be another test. Let's see if they tell us what it is. Wait a minute. Okay, resume must complain hours per week. Okay, blah, blah. Submit the copy of your certificate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then wait. I'm looking for something in particular having to do with those words up there. How to apply? Yeah, you apply through USA Jobs. Builder. Uh, I will talk about the builder in a minute, but <clears throat> okay, wait a minute. Select your documents. Oh, there it is. Look, look, everybody. See this right here? You will, after you submit and your application is in, they'll send you an email and they will invite you to take this test here called the USA Higher Competency Assessment. It takes three hours to take this test. There's five parts and it's required. You have to do it if you're going to apply for this job. And once you, once you do the a USA Higher test, you don't ever have to do it again, thank you, like for a whole year, because they keep the score. Um, look, it says set aside at least three hours. Thank you. It's five parts. You can stop between the parts. You could do one part a day. A friend of mine just took the test, and she recommends you do one part a day so you can stay calm. So a lot of people don't know this exists. Um, anyway, so the, the way I knew it was because of uh, 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 those words there. That means USA Hires test is coming. And this includes a situational judgment test, like little videos. What would you do if? It's, based, it's not based on the job. It's not based on the requirements for the job. It's, a, um, it's just a common sense test. Okay, but now I want to show you something else. Here's the specialized experience questionnaire right there. Look at this. You can see these questionnaires in the announcement as a preview. So let's just take a look at it and see how many job-related questions there are. So, okay, these are all eligibility questions about veterans preference, 30% or more, military families, you say no to all that. Uh, CTAP, that's a no. Current Fed, no. VOA, no. Public land, yeah. Include your certificate. Uh, ICTIP, no. Are you a former employee of land management? Just answer that based on what is true. They have a lot of questions about personnel stuff. Just go through it. I'm still trying to go to the job related questions. I will be there in just a minute. Oh, if you have a disability, you check that off. And then you send a Schedule A letter along with your application. You can get a Schedule A letter that will document a disability. Um, and that is letters don't identify the disability. They just say you're, a, you're employable, but you have a disability. And 
It's fine to do that. It's not a negative. Okay, here we go. Job related questions. I want to qualify for the GS5 because I have one year spe specialized experience or I have four years of study over um, high school or I have both education and specialized. That would be good. You can check that off. Same thing for the seven. I do have a license, yes. All right, now listen to this, everybody. This is extremely important. Experience with customer or client complaints. So you have five choices here of how to choose your answer. And I'll tell you right now, E is the right answer, but I'm gonna tell you how to think about it. And I'm not gonna recommend that you lie. I recommend you think about all the experience you have in your work, your volunteer, your teamwork, playing on baseball or any team thing you do. Okay, read the E. It says, I'm an expert in performing this task. Well, maybe you're not an expert. I've supervised this task. Well, maybe you have not supervised this task. Or normally I am the person who has consulted to help other people. Maybe you have helped other people handle a person who is complaining. Maybe you're on a team and somebody was really mad and you help them calm down. You help them breathe. Or I've trained other people in doing this task. So maybe you've trained some team members on how to stay calm and not get upset if they lose or somebody on your work crew got in a bad mood because it started raining and everybody's miserable. You help people calm down. That's an E. You hear me? This is a test. This is a score. This job involves two tests. This one here and USA hires. All right, the next one. Uh, identify conflicting recreational uses in the resource area and recommend corrective action. So this has to do with recreational uses to have a problem. And you had to give them recommendation on how to change it. So you have to think about your work that you've done, National Park Service, if you've had any conflicting uses in a resource area and how you fixed it. Oh, it's a little bit more technical. Respond to customer inquiries. Yeah, you're an E. You talk to people, don't you? Yeah, you do. You answer questions. You interpret different things. Now, if you were taking this class and you didn't listen to me talk and explain this to you, you need to share with your friends, your colleagues you work with. If you check off C, that I perform this task on my job and my job is closely monitored. Or if you check off D, I perform this task as really part of my job. I do it independently, normally without review. If you check off D to all these questions, you're not gonna get best qualified. Cause you really wanna get try to get a score of 90 at least. Let's see how many questions there are. Oh, this is one heck of a good questionnaire. I'm glad I opened this one. Oh, look at this. Oh, 27 questions. And I'm recommending that you check off E if you can. Now, look, there's a whole lot of talking in this job. Conduct visitor, customer contact, friendly, courteous. Now, you can get this experience from your internship you just had, from a job you had before, being on a team member for a school project, and yes, I do customer contact and I'm really friendly. And I do this all the time and people ask me for help once in a while. <laughs> hey, Glenn, isn't it, isn't it crazy that this questionnaire applies to students GS57? Isn't it amazing? Because they, they see this word expert and supervisor and then they get nervous. Yeah, you, a lot of this stuff is is so can. You got to remember, I mean, currently right now, I've got a list of 2,018 positions that are open. So there are so many standard position descriptions and qualifying exams and questionnaires like this. And sometimes they don't get proofed as well as they should, or they're not catered to that specific because it's just easier to do a mass push like that and yeah. take the data analytics out of it. And then and it actually gives you a better chance of being referred 
having more questions because it's a higher percentage of uh, there's a higher failure rate if you don't select all E's. Higher so. failure rate. There you go. <laughs> so, since you're taking this class and I'm here to tell you, try if you can to check off the highest level. I coached a guy, a real high level guy, he's a 14, and he was absolutely perfect. And like 15 questions, except for one. One question he had no idea. And he said, I don't know what to do. But his background, his education experience was perfect for the job, just perfect. I said, well, it's up to you. I think you should check it off E, up to you. He did it, he checked off E. It was only one question. He, he winged it, he did it. All right, let me answer some more questions here. Uh, Maria says, can you talk about the algorithm? I've heard selection takes the top 90%. Maria, every agency is different. Uh, uh, so I can tell you a couple. Fort Meade Army is 100%. Army Redstone Command in Redstone, Alabama is 100%. Um, Mechanicsburg has an Army Depot. They're cut off as 70. They're all different. You don't know what it's gonna be. So you just wanna try to go to the highest as you can. And uh, I'm now, I, I, I mean, I, I saw the screen of an HR person for Fort Meade. I saw right on her screen, the screen was right here. She had the numbers of the questionnaire right down here, down the middle. I saw 180, 70, 100, 90, 95. And she never looked at any job, any people's resumes, unless they got 100. So, you know, so here's the thing. If you see a questionnaire and it has 10 questions and seven of them you cannot do, don't apply. You're just not going to get there. You're not. So just look at the questionnaire and see if you can answer it. Gabriella, the way you get 100 is you check off E for all of them. That's how. So you have to say, so ability to provide information to the public. Well, all of you being just getting out of school, you're good at that. You talk to people, you train, you, you've done capstones, presentations, it's E. That's how you do it. Um, yeah, all different from all agencies, that's right. Uh, Ash says, I was told once to think about the expert to the level of the GS to which you're applying to. You could do that and still need to try to check off E if you can, the highest level. Yeah, I was leaning toward E if you can, you know, right. Okay, all right, so that was a really good example, wasn't it? That was with Interior. Man, I think you might see that USA Hires exam. Have any of you taken that test yet? Anybody take USA Hires yet? Tell us. No. Well, oh, one person did. Wait, 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 wait. That was me, Catherine. Good. Oh, you <laughs> Why did you take it? Testing. Did you, did you have to take it for the job you just got at MPS? No, I had to test it for... Uh, a sociological study. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, my book designer, Paulina, just took it. And um, I got some recommendations from her. I could send them to you if you want. But her big recommendation was that it's five parts and she thinks it's exhausting and that you should take one part a day. <laughs> oh, Maria did take it. And I was too humble on it. <laughs> Oh, uh oh, <laughs> don't do that. Too humble. <laughs> That's hard. No, you can't retake it. No. Thank you for that question. Oh, after a year. Yeah. Meanwhile, oh, a whole year. I know. Ouch. I agree with that. Um, all right. So anyway, you do you have it? Do you know what you mean now by the specialized experience? Yeah, you do. Um, I think I want to go over to the book here. Um, so here's the book. Wait a minute. Maybe it's not on the screen. I don't know. Oh, yeah. It's up. Okay. So there you go. 
So here's the table of contents, which I just talked about. Now I want to go to page 59 and look at the basic resume here. 59. So personal information, education, and work history. That's a basic. That's probably what you all have right now. And there's the basic resume right there. Now I, I'm I'm recommending now, since I published this book, that you have education first above the research project. So that would be a change I would make if I reprinted it. Now, this section here of skills is something that I really want you to add to your resume. A lot of people don't do it unless, I don't know, they think of it. Um, she has skills in SOPs, laboratory standards, attention to detail, understanding of electronic document thing, laboratory experience, computer skills. So working for National Park Service, there's a lot of technical skills and knowledge and databases that you have that take a look at your resume, will you, everybody? Look at it and look for technical skills, computers, clinical, scientific, lab. Here's the question. Do you have them listed in a separate category section? Because that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to blend it into the duties because I don't think they're going to see it. The bottom of each category. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Rihanna, good. Thank you. Maria says, I was told that if veteran applies, they would be given a chance for an interview, whether qualified or not. Oh, no. The veteran has to be qualified. That's why veterans have a really hard time, even with their fantastic veterans preference, because their resumes don't match the announcement. Veterans preference is only for veterans that are qualified for the job. Oh, so some people do have separate skills. Separate skills. Well, I want all of you to have a separate skills section on your resume so that, there you go. Admin, technical, museum, research. Oh boy, Diana, that's good. That's a lot of information. Don't you think it's a good idea, Glenn, to have the technical skills separated out of the duties from the jobs and separated from the courses and everything? Yes, we, we do enjoy that separation. We really like to see education that is the formal education. And I greatly appreciate the certifications and credentialing. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when, I mean, not, maybe not so much at this level, but when you start going for the biological, natural mm -hmm. sciences, uh, acquisition related positions and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it makes our life, it just makes it a lot easier. There's a better chance that you're going to get a email from a recruiter saying, hey, please go and apply for this position. Or yeah. if you have a special hiring authority, yeah. like if you have a schedule A later, if it's listed below your name and your email address, and we know we can pull you potentially as a direct hire authority, that is yeah. huge. Because uh, then I just send that resume directly to the hiring manager and then they evaluate whether or not they want to hire you or not. That's the language you would use for Schedule A. Uh, look, um, Kaylee just added her specialized experience, her technical skills here. And she has environmental studies, anthropology skills, field surveys. Uh, introductory language, species, communications, organization, writing, graphics. Oh, you know, if you've, if you've got graphic skill, you need to put your technology in there, Adobe Connect and whatever. So make, you can make that even more technical, but this is really nice. And you could add your specific uh, technical computer skills as well. Oh, but Isabella, this is a question here. How is PLC treated compared to DHA? Well, I can describe DHA for you and then Glenn can talk about PLC. Direct hiring authority for post-secondary students is, um, I'll just tell you a story. Um, I taught a class at a university and I was teaching resumes like this. And then DOD sent four recruiters to this school, tiny little school in Lynchburg, Virginia, and they were going to have a panel. So I went to the, uh, I wanted to hear them speak. And they were sitting there talking to each other. 
before the people, the students came in and they were saying, I love this DHA. I love this DHA. I can hire people right here. I love this DHA. And I said, what is a DHA? <laughs> I didn't even know at the time. And they said, that's a post-secondary recruitment authority for students and post-secondary students, something. We can hire students right today, right now in this room. If I have a job and they're qualified for it and the resume shows it, I can hire them right now. Wow. All right. <laughs> so that's a post-secondary hiring authority. And um, for DHA, our resume will go somewhere else other than USA Jobs. Nope. <laughs> Only if you go to a job fair. If you go to a job fair, you take your resume and you put at the top of the resume that you're authorized for post-secondary hiring authority. And then the recruiter, like those, those DOD people, they would take your resume back to work with them. And then they will call you up. So, so Glenn, I'm sure you work with the DHA in your recruitment as well, right? Yep, we sure do. And we're developing a, a, a massive talent pool or database, whatever you want to call it, of those that we know that have a special hiring authority or a direct hiring authority. Uh, just like PLC, I'm, I'm working with those leaders within the MPS and Department of Interior to try to develop a better system of capturing those PLC graduates. That way I as a recruiter can look at them and, and offer them other positions outside of where, where they got their 640 hours or their PLC certification from. So that's coming. I mean, that's for the National Park Service, that is coming, but that's one of my big efforts, but yeah. Ooh, I like that. That's good. Uh, Tatiana says, so if we have a score of 90 plus on the test, then my resume gets looked at and they see the DHA at the top. Well, I mean, so you applied online through USA Jobs. You got a score of 90. Um, can they get it selected? The DHA is mostly used at job fairs or by recruiters, not so much USA Jobs. But that's a question. What do you think, Glenn? They, they, they wouldn't use the DHA to hire directly competitive on USA Jobs, would they? Typically, if a job has already been announced in USA Jobs and it has a job announcement, it has to go through the entire widgets. So it has to go through the classification. It has to go through the HR staffing, which is the grading of the resume. It has to go through that scoring matrix. Mm -hmm. And then the referral list is generated. And then it goes to the hiring manager for selection for interviews. Mm -hmm. So if it's on USA Jobs as a job announcement, it's going the full cycle. We yeah. as recruiters mm -hmm. research your searchable resume when a hiring manager says, Glenn, I need help hiring this natural science or biologist or, you know, I need an intern to, to, to fill our talent pool. Then I go out and search those resumes on USA Jobs or I go to job fairs or I go to career counselors at, at local universities that are near where we need that person. And then I gather resumes and I look at that resume and that's the only thing I look at. Very rarely do I interact with individuals like this class. This is rare. I, I never do this anymore. I mean, I'm in charge of an entire national recruitment plan. So, you know, the days of recruiting going up, shaking hands is pretty much over. So, but we look at these resumes. If we said, if we can validate there's a direct hire authority, we're going to dig into it deeper and we're going to look for that schedule a letter. If it's not in USA jobs, we pass you over. You're going to have to wait for the job to announce if we don't find the right candidate for the hiring manager. Yeah, that's right. Um, Everything needs to be on your resume. Uh, will you have a DHA certificate after this internship, Tatiana? I don't, you don't get a certificate for DHA, direct hire authority. You get a certificate for the internship, right? Yeah, you, you get a certificate for the completion of whatever program you're in. If it's a public land court, then you get a, a certification saying you've completed the 640 hours of that program. Yeah. Uh, there's conservation court. There's a lot of other ones that could potentially qualify for. Uh, there's no way one person will know all of those. But when we talk about direct hire authority, we're talking about 30% disabled veterans are hired with a VA letter that says they're service connected at 30% or higher. Or somebody has taken the time the resource to schedule a stop my foot on the ground and review the s standard form 256 and if you have one of those conditions go talk to your doctor they will there's a standardized you can google it 
you know, schedule a federal hiring letter, and there's an example for it with the appropriate legal verbiage that's in there. It doesn't list what your disability is. Right. But that SF-25 or 256, sorry, it's just it's a checklist to say what are approved conditions that can be considered under the Schedule A law. So if, if you do your due diligence and you happen to have one of those and a doctor is willing to put uh, that Schedule A uh, CFR verbiage on their letterhead and sign it with their medical license, mm -hmm. then, you know, make sure you annotate that and make it clear and upload that letter in the USA jobs. Because when I go looking for a biologist, a GS5, GS6, or a, a 7911 developmental assignment, that's what I'm going to key in and look for. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have to go find that job on USA Jobs and you're going to have to apply for it. I'm not going to waste that much time staring you towards that job announcement. Yeah. So it's really interesting to hear in this class that, yes, you apply for jobs on USA Jobs. And you do the documents, you do the assessment test and score highest you can. Then you might do the USA Hires thing. We don't know. And then they look for the one year specialty, the whole thing up and down, up and down. Or your college or college in your state might have a job fair where National Park Service or Bureau of Land Management or Fish and Wildlife or NOAA might come to the job fair and they might bring along with them requisitions for 25 jobs that are of various types of jobs. And that is where the direct hire authority works. Go to the job fairs and then you can apply for the job. And, and like I said before, it has to be within two years of you graduated, so don't fool around. You have to do it right away. And the direct hire authority is just amazing. I taught a class of recruiters for Secret Service uh, all around a room, 12 of them. They just come from a job fair and they had folders like this with resumes in them, all resumes. They're all one page resumes and they could not qualify anybody for any Secret Service job on that one page resume. So then what they tried to do is they wrote to the students to say, I need the resume to demonstrate teamwork and whatever their qualifications are. Most of the students didn't write back. So they, they had a really hard time getting the students to write the resume like I'm telling you to do here and to match the qualifications. Um, and then I'll tell you one horrible thing. They had a questionnaire that had 100 questions. I can't even believe I'm saying that out loud. <laughs> they weren't all job related though. They had to do with drugs and I don't know, a bunch of stuff, it was wild. But- hey, um, Kathy, can I answer one question real quick? Yeah. If you're in the PLC uh, certificate program, when you get that certificate at the completion of the 640 hour program, that certificate qualifies you for a direct hire authority. So within two years of your graduation, I can go and say, hey, this is a PLC graduate and your certificate's in the USA Jobs application in your profile, then yes, those that have the land management, if I can qualify for that, I will send that resume directly to the hiring manager before it gets posted to USA Jobs. If that hiring manager asks for me to go out and find that person. So that is a direct hire authority. It's not a DHA letter. It's your PLC okay. certificate showing that you're eligible to be picked up directly. Yeah. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Ash said, is being qualified and having the right network, asking around. Network is really good. Just look for um, hiring, hiring events from colleges that are nearby that would have your majors that specialize in your field of work. And most of the job fairs are virtual now, so you don't even have to go there. You don't have to go in person. Okay, here's the resume that got Savannah hired um, right here. She did get hired as a GS7, Consumer Safety Officer for um, FDA. And I'll make it a little bit bigger. She got hired during the pandemic. She did not see a coworker for a whole year. So there's the courses right there. That is not hard to do, is it? To type those courses out there like that? She left uh, high school on, you don't have to do that, but she had it on there. And she has her um, GPA, 317. 
2.17. And then here's her school, her, her uh, technician job, hours per week, 40 hours a week, 22 an hour. You don't have to put salary on, but you can. Address and uh, address is required field in the builder. Now this resume here is a paper resume. It's not a builder. So we'll talk about the builder here a little bit. Um, oh, let me ask you, those of you who have a USA Jobs account set up, uh, do you have a upload resume or a builder resume? Or both? Go ahead and type in there. You have both or one or the other. I prefer uh, upload. Yeah, it's real bad. Upload, upload, okay, good. I got a, I got one super amazing reason why it's better. <laughs> With the builder, education is at the end. At the very end, after all that work in school, and it's at the end. So that, uh, that that's number one right reason. And another good reason is that when the managers get the builder resumes, the type font is small. Hey, Glenn, do you when you get a builder resume, is the type font still really small? Or did they fix it? It is. Oh, no. no. But I, I'll give you another tip. We love control F. Uh -huh. What's that? I bet your students know what that means. Control F. You tell we me. Search oh, sir. Oh, yeah. I love the search. <laughs> I love this. I use it all the time when I'm coaching resumes. It's a blast. Because when people send me their... Uh, their resume is an announcement. There's always one word that stands out. Like this, this one guy, he was a DOD military type, type person and he wanted to apply for a job at the UN and humanitarian work. The whole thing was humanitarian work. So I did a search. I did the control find on the word humanitarian. Not in the resume at all. So I told him, uh, you know, did you do some humanitarian work that you didn't think to put on the resume? He didn't. Ed is good. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, so there's a job. Now look at her skills section. That is beautiful, isn't it? Nobody has to look for this stuff. I'm telling you, when I see resumes, reviewing them, people do not do this. They blend their, their R and all their fancy statistical skills in the text and a sentence and a paragraph. They're not going to see it. So I want you all to do this. And then let's just look at here, the laboratory teaching assistant. So let's just say you were a, a coach for soccer or little league for a year or so, and you did it three summers, 20 hours a week. That is a job block. It is not just a volunteer experience. You could put month and year, hours per week, the name of the team and the fact that you did team leader and coaching and mentoring and interpreting laws and rules and regulations and coach people to stay calm. It's incredible leadership experience. Nonprofit volunteer work is very important. Let me ask you a question here, everybody. Do you have a nonprofit or volunteer job or activity that you can use as a job block now that you know you can do it? A lot of people do. Because you can get experience from it. Communication skills, recruitment, planning, coordination, uh, a ton of skills. But I, you probably don't have it as a job block right now because you didn't really think you could do it, but you sure can. Doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter if you have a gap. Nope, 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 nope. Just don't think about it. Lot, every, all students have gaps. Did a lot of volunteer in high school. That's fine. If it's high school, yeah, put it down. Yeah, you do have to write it. You have to put it down on the resume. If you want to get credit for it, and you could make it a job block and try to get some credit for your time. You don't need a form filled out for it. Just write it down. People can get hired. I taught a class at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services one time, and there was a young lady in the class. I looked at her resume, and she was working as a postal carrier for postal service for like eight years. And she's sitting in my room at CMS. She's a health insurance specialist. 
I said to her, how did you get hired? Where? She said, I helped people get on Medicare and Medicaid part-time at my church for 10 years. Oh my God. <laughs> That's how she got hired. Her entire volunteer work was working for Medicare and Medicaid. Incredible. I said, oh yeah, you do it. Well, Kaylee, yeah, don't put it under a separate section. You need to make it a job block if you want to get credit. Most people just say volunteer experience. And they do one, two, three, four, five. You're not going to get credit for it that way. I mean, if it's a tiny little job, go ahead and write it down like that. But if it's a really substantial volunteer thing, make it a job block. No, you don't have to have somebody sign off. No. Just say it, write it, write it. If you do have a reference, that's fine. I don't think they look for verification. No, they don't. No, just do it. Okay, so there's the resume. Now I want to show you a couple more resumes in the book. Uh, I have all the resumes on one page here. Look, page five. All the resumes are right here. So you don't have to wonder where they are. We'll look at page 65 right now at this IT person. So he broke his courses out into computers, economics, and statistics. I like that. And there's one of his academic projects. Look at that. It's five lines long. He gets credit, a lot of coding experience. And then this is his one job that he had. And he's using our format with the all caps, the keywords that came out of specialized experience, data analysis. And we have here salary hours per week. You know, a lot of people don't believe or just don't type month and year hours per week in street address. They just don't. And they have HR has to see it. Okay, there's Savannah again. Oh, let me go back up to the list again. I don't know the page numbers by heart. Let's look at page 78. So when you come to the class, uh, when we when you come to the class, when we have that class in DC, bring your longer version resume with you if you want. And you can take a look at it. Can PLC contact the hiring manager or does the hiring manager contact people first? Yes. Yeah. Anybody, the, the list of the information that's in the USA job announcement, that's why it's there. If you want to reach out and talk to them, or if it's just a centralized you know, agency email box, you can reach out to them. Very rarely will you see the actual hiring manager listed in the USA jobs job announcement. But if you know who the hiring manager is, yeah, reach out. Yeah, it's called networking. Yeah, networking, right? All right, so here's a, a, a person who's applying for archives technician. She's got a summary here at the top. You don't really have to write a summary. It's just a style. And then this is all her archiving experience in a list right here. So that's her technical skills right there for archives. And then there's her master's in applied history, her specialized coursework. And then here's her archivist practicum. And she's got month and year and hours per week right there. So that's good. And then another internship, 20 hours per week. And then selected research papers. See, this is how the resumes become three pages. And then let me tell you something. I want you all to use 12 point type. Uh, I would like one inch margins, but you could do 0.75. Gotta make it easy to read. Don't use the small type font. And in terms of your sections, you're going to have um, skills, certifications, education, internships, work history, nonprofit, volunteer. So, and then when you get down to your work history, like here for the internship, this person wrote, wrote a research paper on the early history of the village of Buckland. 
chartered by the Virginia legislature in 1798. So she writes a little story about her work there. And this is kind of what you're gonna do for your NPS project, is you're gonna write it up in uh, you know eight sentences or something. Um, I wanna, I wanna ask you a question here. You, you can type uh, eight words or 10 words. Um, what is the major project you are working on now in your inter your, your internships? Go ahead and give us a title of it or a short description, eight words. And Glenn and I wanna see what projects you're working on now. I'll give you a minute to do that. Guys, you're doing some interesting things. So all of these need to become a job block. You know that it's a job block. NPS internship, it's a job block. And then underneath the job block, you're gonna write about your project. And as you can see here with this sample, the project is described in that many words. See that right there? Eight lines, and that's not 12 point type either. That's too small, it's 10 point, I think. So you're gonna to need to write 10 or 15 sentences that will describe the project that you're working on now. Month and year, hours per week. So if you look at your resume now, and I assume you have your resume up to date maybe with NPS on there, maybe you don't, I don't know. You better do it, you gotta write it up. If you have it on your resume now, uh, if it is on the resume now, how many sentences do you have to describe this project? Go ahead, just tell us, how long is it? Look at your resume. Three sentences. Eight, four, Ash has four. It's not enough, Ash. Ah, 13, that's good. So, so what do you think, Glenn? Since this is a huge, important part of their resume, this internship that they have now, don't you think it should be like a half page or something, or at least a third of a page, this whole internship story? Yeah, I would definitely think so. I mean, depending on, again, it depends on what job announcement that you're applying for, or just in general for a resume to have it in USA Jobs. Because like I said, sometimes we're going to look at it and that's going to get you referred directly to a direct hire authority. If you have, you know, once you complete this program, you'll be authorized that. So it's not always going to be based on that job announcement. So if you put as much information in there and then you have, you cater off of that towards that job announcement, then you're usually more successful. But yeah, I would think this internship should be probably closer to a full page. If you're able to equate that to what you're looking to do, what is your purpose and passion? What are you going to want to do when you come out of this internship? And those are the things you want to look at and you want to look at what jobs are already out there on USA jobs that's being announced and look at those job announcements because they are typically the same. Uh, we're in a cut and paste world nowadays. 
So people take things out of databases, they cut and paste it, or they automate it to, to make their lives easier. So if you see a, a job somewhere else, maybe not in your ge geographical area, but you can use that to, to, to write your initial resume and keep adding stuff. You see four or five different jobs, you, you, you have a purpose and passion for, you think, after completion of, of school or internship, build a resume for it. Yeah. You know, just have them on standby. When the job comes out, post it. Um, I taught a class at Smithsonian for interns. Uh, they'd already been doing their internship, just like you all. They came live, like 15 students. Everybody had a one-page resume. Every single person. It's just not enough content. That's why I asked you, how long is the description of your current project now? And Glenn just said, whole page. I said a half a page. So you need to write about uh, the scope of the project, um, technical skills, if you work with anyone else, teamwork, description. You could write about the challenge of the project. I'm gonna ask you a question about that. You could write about the actions you took, the research you did, uh, the results of the project, the success of the project, uh, the value of it, purpose. I mean, a lot of stuff. So here's, here's a question for you, get you to think about your project. Here it is. What has been the biggest challenge of your project that you are on now? Just write eight words. What's the biggest challenge of this project that you've been working on? It could be people, money, place, I don't know, technology. Biggest challenge. Could be first ever, you're creating the whole thing. The challenges are really good for resumes. Lack of previous research, right? Accessing data. Oh, lack of materials. These are good. Remember I told you about the C car, the context of the story, the challenge of your work, actions that you took, and results. That is the way you can tell your internship story is by using that formula. The first ever for the region, yeah. Make sure you say that. Schedule working with the schedule, it kept changing. You had to show a lot of flexibility. You had to research stories of people and do a lot of extensive, clever research. Oh, you're so, that's okay. You're just writing the resume for HR, not the public. So that's cool. So I want you to add the challenges that you overcame in doing your project so that it shows initiative and resourcefulness, flexibility, problem solving skills, leadership. It says so many things about you if you write about the, the challenge of your project, not just your actions. So, um, you know, I, uh, I have accomplishment I can email to you. Oh, let's see. I was at the National Military Park in Vicksburg, Mississippi about two months ago, teaching the same thing in person. And I got a chance to take a tour of the whole military park, which is hundreds of acres. It was fascinating. And um, a historian took me through two hours and he, he was in my class. And I, I interviewed him in the class about an accomplishment that I heard because he was in the National Park, he was an interpreter. And um, he told a CCAR story in the class about one of his positions, the National Park Service position. And I'll, I'll email it to you without his name, but he was uh, part of the NPS to set up the Shanksburg, Pennsylvania 9-11 National Park. Yep, the original team. And he had to set up the park with no building, there's no building there. You had to do it with audio 
and uh, words. And he had to be very considerate of the people who lived through the 9-11 and people who are younger and didn't know it. So that was a challenge of writing the interpretation and uh, he produced it and wrote it and um, no building. He says, that was a challenge, it was no building. He couldn't put anything in a building, it wasn't pictures. It had to be all words. So that was a cool story and um, I can send it to my coordinator and I'll, I'll send it to you because it's, it's a very uh, amazing story. And you all have interesting uh, Park Service stories too and challenges. You really do, but you gotta write it down. Uh, or it's not going to be there. So, um, so Glenn, when you see a resume, NPS resume, it's good if you see some details of an NPS work or project, isn't it? Isn't it good to see some background and some content? Absolutely. Uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm the recruiter, I'm the pre-screener, so I look at it, and when I see that, if I see there's already National Park Service experience, and keep in mind, I've been a DOD recruiter in HR with the Department of the Army as well. So we all kind of look for the same things. You know, we all look for what's on the job announcement or what skills or competencies that we're looking for. Or if there's education or a certification, we want to look for that. If we see that they've already have experience with National Park Service, we are going to spend more time on that resume pre-clearing it. I mean, I hate to say that, but it's human nature. We see that, oh, okay, wait a minute. Oh, I can align this. Remember, I got an Excel spreadsheet of 2,000 plus jobs I'm trying to fill. Yeah. So if I see something that says National Park Service, I'm going to go back. I'm going to do spend more time looking at that resume and see if there's something I can refer them to. Or if I can just hand their resume off to a direct hire authority. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I, I, the content is so important in the resume and, and new grads, that's why I wrote a whole book for new grads is that new grad resumes are too short. Mostly if you go to the career center at your school and say, let me see some samples, they're gonna show you one or two page resumes and that's it. And that's the problem here with, um, with these resumes, they need to be longer. Let's look at page 92. Oh, there's a cover letter sample there. So you can use a cover letter if you want. I have a builder on my website, a cover letter builder that you could use to produce a letter that looks just like this if you want to. Oh, I know what I want to do. Where, where, where was I? Yeah, and keep track of your applications. Um, I think when I teach your class um, live, I'll go to my USA Jobs account and go in there and show you the searchable link. But you'll see it when you upload, it's right here. See that right there that on the screen right there? Is it searchable? Just click, choose one that's a searchable term. And now we know from Glenn that searchable works, at least for NPS, we know it works. It works for NASA too, they use it. Not all agencies do use it, they should use it. If they have specialized experience and knowledge, then they definitely should use it. Um, let's go back and look for another announcement. Let's do, um, let's just type in biology. See what comes up. Uh, okay, wildlife biologists, BLM. Let's just see what they want. This closes 614, GS12, Medford. Land base is here. Okay, going down. I wanna see if it's education or experience or both. Basic requirement, degree, or combination education. So degree is required. And it has to be at least nine semester hours in wildlife subjects of these, and at least 12 hours in zoology. So read that section carefully. Oh, hey, let me ask you a question. Do you, um, do you have your courses, do you have your courses typed up in your resume now? Go ahead, tell us. If I can't look at all your resumes. Tatiana, we'll answer that in a second. 
just related ones, that's okay. Well, make sure you type the course titles that are relevant for the job. Okay, then um, additional requirement is here. And see the and with the stars? So they also wanna see that you have one year specialized experience at the 11 level doing leadership or support for terrestrial wildlife. You gotta have that. Monitoring processes for federal laws for endangered species. So they're very clear with the qualifications that they want. And you find those qualifications right here. It says, in describing your experience, be clear and specific. We do not make assumptions. They definitely do not make assumptions. So look, look at there. It's a volunteer experience. You must add month, year, hours per week to get credit for your work or volunteer. Thank you. Yeah, look at that. That's nice, right? Yeah. And then, of course, you have to have your transcripts. Um, uh, let's see if that USA Hires thing is required. How to be evaluated? No, they're not using it. These are not USA hires. You can usually tell by that laundry list of those competencies that are there. Um, now we had a question up here I wanted to answer. Tatiana typed it up here. There it is. All right, listen to this one, Glenn. I've been hearing from park staff, despite PLC and DHA, that I will still likely be placed as a seasonal staff, not hired as permanent, definitely not as a nine. How do I make sure that the job is a permanent position and not get trapped in seasonal? Because seasonals are not doing this resume hacks. And what does this mean? <gasps> I, I understand this challenge. Uh, I know yeah. exactly what she's saying. So. The largest majority of our workforce, believe it or not, is seasonal. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion being made about how can we do this better, especially for PLC intern graduates. So with that said, that's why I was hired. And that's why a team of five other people have been hired. And I'm standing up this national recruitment team to try to address some of these issues. Now, some of that recruiters are not going to address. But you, as a potential candidate, when you're looking at USA Jobs, look at what the job announcement says. Is it a full-time position? Is it term? Is it seasonal? That's, your, that's how you tell on the job announcement if it's a permanent position or not. If you're not 100% sure, scroll down to the bottom, find out who the POC is for that agency, and reach out to them. If it's National Park Service, you know what? I've got a list of all 2,000 plus jobs and who the hiring managers are. My job is to make their lives easier. So, you know, if you've got questions in the National Park Service, my email is there. So, you know, it's there's no easy answer for it. It's about looking for the job that you want. If you're locked into a geographical location, you've got to look at where to get the foot in the door to go forward. But be careful about that foot in the door. Because if you take too low of a position, you can only progress through the GS steps once you get in there. So if you have a higher qualification, uh, you know, seasonal versus permanent, when possible, go permanent, you know, but there's not a whole lot of permanent positions out there. So you got to discover what your purpose and passion is and what you really want to go after. Yeah. There's no yeah, guarantee that you're going to get a permanent position. In my opinion, everybody that's on the intern position, like Department of Defense, should be moving right into a permanent position upon the completion of that, that two-year training period. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have that level of responsibility yeah. and, and right. authority. So look at the jobs, look at it, see what it is. It's my job to make the hiring manager's life easier. So if I can presenting them with a qualified candidate before it ever goes to USA job for announcement in competition, who knows? And that's where recruiters come in handy. There's not very many of us left in this world. So, <laughs> so, so all I can say is read the job announcement, make networks while you're doing this internship, talk to your Rangers, talk 
to the, the managers, the staffing organization folks, talk to them, find out how did you become a permanent employee? You know, yeah. network with them to find out, hey, what's going on? And most importantly, take credit for what you're doing, okay? Yeah. I'm well in my 50s. I'm retired from the military. You know, I'm on my, my third career. I'm still going to school. And every time I take a class, I think now from an HR perspective of, man, there's so many competencies that I'm learning. It's not just the skills that you're learning from the class. You're learning time management. You're learning administrative skills. You're learning self, uh, uh, I can't think, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> you're learning a lot of technical you're learning a lot of technical skills and you're learning yeah uh, yeah exactly writing you're learning software yeah communication skills interpersonal communication right. skills you know so you know really look at it and see what you're doing be honest don't fake the funk don't lie about it you know be honest with yourself but take but take credit for what you're doing most people do not most people do not take credit for what they do on a day-to-day -day basis yeah I've noticed that too. People deflate more than they inflate. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so Glenn just said, be sure to read uh, the type of appointment the job is. This one here is permanent. So read it and make sure. But another point he made that was really good. So let's say you have a master's degree, you're qualified for an 11, no, a, a nine, a nine. So if you were to take a seven or a five just to get in, Let's say you did a five just to get in with you couldn't apply for a nine the next year you'd have to go next year seven and the next year a nine so if you find a seasonal that's nine uh maybe that'd be good and then that way you'd be a nine already and you wouldn't have to wait all that time let me see if i can find a seasonal is there any way to uh just look for seasonal jobs i don't think there is I don't think so. Wait a minute. Let me type seasonal in here. See if it comes up. You know, I've never searched for a candidate view for seasonal work. Never either. <laughs> I never either. <laughs> no, it didn't work. It didn't work. It says permanent there. It didn't work. Um, Y'all don't know this, but uh, uh, listen to this. Probably here. too late for the seasonals too, because I mean, it, yeah. If you're if you're a person who's looking for a remote job, look at this here. You can search where we only show remote jobs. Look at that. Isn't that cool? <laughs> That's a new search term on USA Jobs. Only remote. So then, if you wanted to go, there's not too many for NPS, but just for fun, we'll just do land management, okay? And then we'll do uh, we'll do a nine. Oh, oh, let's go down to agency, the NPS, see if there's any. I'll bet there's not. What, remote positions? Yeah. No, there's there are. I'm a, well, I haven't announced mine yet, but I, I'm, I'm recruiting for a recruiter. So. And I'm also looking for an HR assistant, which is a GS5, to do administrative and human resources and recruitment assistance. So is that, that, that going to be a remote too? Yep. Both those positions 100% remote. Oh. And more likely, I'll probably use a uh, Schedule A or PLC or one of those hiring tours. So it'll probably right. never hit USA Jobs. Uh, yeah. GS 13 position will. We will definitely compete that one. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, we sure have covered a lot today. You know, it's been great having you on, Glenn, since you, you know, Glenn's real new at his job. I met him at PEO Missiles. <laughs> they teach a lot of classes. Army you know, Contracting Command before that. Army remember? Contracting Command. <laughs> Sorry. I knew it somewhere in Redstone. <laughs> somewhere there. This has been fun. Uh, students, I, I greatly appreciate y'all letting me uh, yeah. participate. And Susan, thank you uh, for allowing me to include in this. And this has been a great experience. I've I've listened to the questions. Your questions are invaluable to They're me. They're incredible. To make the system better, yeah. And you know what? You know why I like to ask questions, Glenn, when I teach his classes and get the chat is because we're gathering information about what they've done, what they know, how long the resume is, and their pro we get a lot of information that is helpful for for you as a recruiter and helpful for me as a coach. 
And and also I like to I, I like to know where people are with their application. USA jobs, how long is your resume? How many pay, how many lines or sentences do you have for your project? That is a really big one because most people have like this much. And you just said a full page. I said a half a page. <laughs> anyway, you know you have to write a lot of content about that project. So yeah. So I, here's, a, here's another question I'm going to ask you. You can type the question here and, and get ready for this one. This is my favorite question, Glenn. What are your top two takeaways from this class today, considering your career objectives for NPS? Go ahead, type over there. Top two things you learned from this class today. This is very good for us to have and, and for your point of contact. Yeah, add, click off search. There you go, Kaylee, right? <laughs> That's super important. It is now that I'm in this position. Yeah, it's searchable. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're just making it work. I didn't even know who was doing searching. And then I recommend you use the upload. Because you can put education first. Hey, Glenn, in, in terms of the resumes you look at, what's a percentage of, of paper resumes upload versus builder? What, what you see? 90%. 90% are uploaded, 10%. Yeah, okay. I mean, th those that are used in the builder, it's a little bit easier for me to search uh, just because from my view, yeah. if it's uploaded, I have to double click to open it, which is no big deal. I mean, it's really not. Whereas you if can it's still search, you can still search builder, and upload. Yeah, exactly. Either one's searchable, so. Does it matter if it's a PDF or a Word? Can you still search? Still search, doesn't matter. All right. Just don't upload a, a, a JPEG of your resume. Because yeah. then I can't search it. I'm like, I wish my time looking at it. Because <laughs> instructions ask for a Word document or a PDF or something. Okay, you guys wrote really good things. One thing else you, you learned was that questionnaire, the assessment questionnaire. Um, give yourself this. This is what HR says. This is the, the way they put it. Give yourself all the credit that you can. So try to go for the highest level on all the questions that you can. I think it's a good way. And then, and then they say, and make sure you consider all aspects of your work, your school, your employment, your volunteer. They really want you to give yourself all the credit you can. A lot of people deflate. They do. So beware. And then that, that uh, USA hires, if you have to take it, if it tells you you have to take it, you have to take it. You, you know, otherwise, you won't be considered for the job. So take your time on that. I will find that sea car story, the Ellis Island, um, no, the uh, Shanksburg, Pennsylvania sea car, I'll send it to you. It's very, very uh, interesting. And it's in the full sea car, the context of where he was, the challenge, no building, that was, that was a challenge. Actions, what he did, he wrote the content and the results, X number of million people have been there and watched it and whatever. That's an NPS story right there. It's what you've been doing, similar. So, Glenn, do you have any more comments or recommendations that you would like to give to the class? I think the biggest thing is sell yourself. Don't be afraid to brag on yourself. Keep it short, sweet, to the point, but use that C-car method. It's a great method. Or you could use a star method, any of the number of the storytelling. It's so much easier to read a story than it is to read a bullet. 
you know, a bullet comment, a bullet sentence, you know, and be sure that if you have a direct hire authority, PLC, any of that stuff, make sure it's up front in the very top below your address, email address, telephone number. You know, it makes life so much easier. If you want somebody, I've put two email addresses in the chat. We are a strategic national level recruitment team. We don't really service individuals. However, I am working on building automation pieces. So if you want to send me your resumes, as you get closer to time to graduate, I will, I don't throw away any resumes. So as I develop this national recruitment team, I'm going to find a way to store those resumes and be able to pull them up to provide to hiring managers. But still, the most important thing is to build your profile on USA Jobs, upload your resume, whatever supporting documentation you have, your transcripts, your Schedule A letter, your DD-214, whatever you have, upload it. It's just there and easy to go. And you'd be surprised how many people are looking at that resume and those supporting documents without even a job announcement being there. It's only going to get more and more as we get more and more competitive for, for candidates, especially those that have the experience and expertise or that training because our workforce is my age, Catherine's age. They're getting close to retirement. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge gap in knowledge management between people that have more than 10 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So that hiring, hiring you know, pendulum is gonna swing to another side and, and we're gonna to have to start filling these positions. So be patient. Apply, apply, apply. Thank you, Glenn. And then also, don't make a short resume. It needs to be three pages. Use the upload, 12-point type. Make it easy to read for HR. Look at the samples that are in the book when you get a copy of it. And um, and tell stories. Your, your current uh, project that you're working on now or your capstone or your thesis, those are uh, examples that you need to detail, not just quick little bullets or whatever. That's why the resumes in government are longer because they need more content. I am just thrilled, Glenn, to know that you are searching for candidates. That is so awesome. <laughs> this is the very first time I have talked about searching resumes in a class. Do you know that? The first time. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get out in front of everybody else. And since I've been with DOD and I've been with PO Missiles of Space, I kind of know what other people are doing. So I had to find some new strategies out there. <laughs> I found one right in front of my face. And it's really amazing. And your emphasis on the on the um, the hiring authority is really important. The direct hire authority and the Schedule A or the PLC, add that information at the top of your resume after your name, phone, email, type up your hiring authority that's there. And if you want to do a Schedule A, see your doctor, you can Google Schedule A. It's all over the internet. Yeah. And uh, your resume is key. The resume is key because like Glenn said, like 10 times, and me too, resume has to show the education, the courses, and the one-year specialized experience and the words from that paragraph in your resume. So we've said it a bunch of times. Um, She's, somebody has a question about, talk later about DOD, possibly working for CEMML. <laughs> What's CEMML, good luck? Well, DOD, all right, I'll take off my MPS hat, I'll be fair. Okay, At, as a sophomore in college, you should be applying for internships with Department of Defense or any federal agency because you can work and get paid as an intern as a junior. So there are student internships. Out there. Oh, I love that golden. I got goldens myself. <laughs> but anyways, you know, now's the time to get out there and start reaching and making those contacts with DOD. You know, apply, 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 read, read the job announcement. Yeah, the Pathways announcements are really, really good. Um, if you know about them and start going you know, as young and early as you can. So, well, I'm all finished with the class today. Thank you very much for attending. Um, here's my email. You can use my personal email. Uh, Glenn, what is your email? It's not in there, I don't think. 
Glenn Dot Hook. It was there. No, it was there. It was there. It's in there. It. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. okay. We got it. I'm not bashful. I think it's in there five or six times. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, say, save the uh, chat for me and Glenn for sure, because we want to look at it again. I want Glenn to see it for sure again. And um, you were, this was a very, very good class for Glenn to attend since he's working on improving recruitment for the PLCs and DHS and all that. So I'm so glad that I mentioned it and here he is and took the time. And I'll see all of you in uh, Washington in August at DOI. And we're going to talk more about projects and you're going to talk to each other a little bit because we're going to be in person. So thanks, everybody. I'm glad we taught the class. It was really good. You learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. We will send out the recording to everyone and their contact information in case you guys want to follow up with them. Right. But thanks so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Glenn, as well. Yeah, that was yeah, great. Basically, including with, with future, if you got questions for National Park Service or just recruitment or HR in general, I've got no problems helping. That's, that's part of what they pay me for. He's a recruiter, that's NPS yeah. recruiter right here in the class. Thank you so much, Glenn. It was very, very good. We want them all to get, well, we want permanent, but you know, seasonal permanent would be good. Right. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day. Day. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Isabella, if you can stay on. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, save that chat, somebody. I'll see you, Glenn. Yes. That was great, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really good. Yes, Catherine. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of awesome. I love the recruiting angle. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he's only had a job like six months. He's new. Oh, wow. He's yeah, I love I've... it. He's working on the PLC to make it better. <laughs>